Hey, yo, I want to talk about breaking news. You may not have heard, but Cynthia Williams, president of Wizards of the Coast, just quit. I may even be the first person to cover this. I mean, okay, okay, look, I'm a cartoon, okay? I know this isn't breaking news, but these videos take a while to come out. However, this is a big deal for Magic the Gathering, and is going to have a knock-on effects for the game in the future. But she was with the company for two years, and we saw a lot of scandals from WotC in that time under her tenure. So today, I thought rather than speculate on what's to come, I'd instead have a look back at one of the most controversial products that released under Williams, open it up, see how bad it really is, and then figure out if we can still have some fun with it. So join me as I open up and try to deck build using... No, 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 not Magic 30. I mean, that was controversial and came out in the last two years, but even now I couldn't afford to get that, so no, it's a different scandal. It's... What? No, God, no, that's not even a product. I mean, yes, the Pinkertons also happened under her, but how would I deck build with... No, no, it's not that. The thing that we're looking at is... Yes, okay, that was also under her, and she said that thing about monetizing it more, but the OGL scandal was for Dungeons and & Dragons. And this is Magic the Gathering, and a picture of the product was in the bloody thumbnail for this video, so I don't know what this bit is that we're doing. Everyone already knows that today we are looking at... Double Feature, thank you! A premium price set which was an uncurated combination of both Midnight Hunt and Crimson Vow, slammed together in one set for draft with packs of 15 cards where both halves of the pack exclusively featured 7 cards from one set or the other. Each pack also included a random foil and 2 rares or mythics, but at a higher price than if you had just bought a full pack of Midnight Hunt and a full pack of Crimson Vow on their own, meaning Double Feature was literally the same experience with less cards for your money. In addition, every card used the original art from the individual sets, but this time they were printed in grayscale. Which meant that, as a draft experience, it was just two sets that didn't feel like they were designed to be drafted together, with cards that were hard to distinguish due to every one of them being in black and white, and a premium price which was higher than normal. Oh, and also draft boxes only included 24 packs. That's 12 packs less than the normal 36, so yeah, oof. So what are we doing today? Well, I sent out one of my human assistants, Mr. Hands, out to get a box, and with his help we're going to open it up, take a look at it, see what you get, look at the quality, try to build some decks with it, and figure out if, at the very least, it was fun, if it was worth the money, and, and if it was really deserving of all of the hate and scorn that it got. And straight away, I have to say, I love opening a box of magic. There's no box topper in this set, which is a shame, but god, look at it. Even after all these years, this is such an experience, you just can't get this in digital, it's a very tactile sensation. The packs themselves are nicely wrapped. I, I always check for tampering, mostly out of habit, but I've never had an issue, so I'm probably getting Mr. Hands to be overly cautious here. But god damn, look at those packs. Beautiful. Thrilling, in fact. Okay, now open a pack and let's look at the quality. Yeah. Bit of a bend on the foil at the back, but that's fine. Or at least as expected. These boxes were sourced in the UK and I think Magic uses different printers for Europe, so your quality may vary elsewhere in the world. Here for instance, the US isn't great. That foil, by the way, is Panicked Bystander, and I must admit, with the grayscale, they do look off, and the art on the foil in particular is hard to make out with that shine. But, Mr. Hands, if you could transition all of that over to our sorting table, please, that's where we'll build our decks, starting, of course, with pack one. I'm thinking today that we open up half the packs from the box, so 12, and challenge ourselves to build two 60 card standard decks, not including basic lands. I cannot imagine that they're going to be any good in a competitive sense, but this set is still standard legal, so I want to know if it's possible, and what it would be like if you and your friends bought a box and wanted to make standard decks just to play against each other. As you can see, my assistant has laid out the first pack, Midnight Hunt Commons, Crimson Vow Commons, the Uncommons, the Rares or Mythics, and then finally the Foil. And looking it over, I feel like this pack spotlight card is probably that panicked bystander again for being our first foil. A nice and out of focus shot there, thank you very much Mr. Hans, doing a wonderful job. Pack 2, and let's see what we get. Ooh, a Foil Cemetery Prowler, that is an amazing pull in the Foil slot, as it's Mythic. But the spotlight card for me goes to the Curse of Shaken Faith, because I am such a big fan of Innistrad, and I love the re-inclusion of curses in these sets. Especially at 2 cost, I love it. Pack 3. And another mythic in Averbrook Caretaker. But for me the spotlight card has to be Rem Carolus, my favourite character in all of Magic the Gathering. 
He's Van Helsing, Dean Winchester and Batman all rolled into one. I mean, the card doesn't really reflect that. I don't know why he's flying or cares about spell damage, but I still like him as a character. Pack four. And Wowza, another mythic in Primal Adversary. But weirdly, my spotlight card for this pack actually goes to Honored Heirloom. And it's for a commander pick. I know that we're building standard decks today, but I like cards like this because I'm just sort of sick of seeing auto-include cards like Soul Ring and Arcane Signet. I know Honored Heirloom is not as good, but I think it's more interesting to play and more flavorful. I'd, I'd rather run one of these in a commander deck any day of the week. Pack five. No Mythics this time, though Blood Pact is a card that I'm a fan of. I think if this was one less mana, it would have dominated. But the Spotlight card is Grafted Identity, because its original Midnight Hunt borderless printing actually had a subtle alternative art variant, one that you may not have even noticed if you weren't looking. And I just think that's neat. Pack 6. And straight away, I just want to talk about one card. So, the Spotlight for this pack is Unruly Mob. It featured in my last Is It Innistrad video as an example of a mob killing a werewolf, but, fun fact, this printing of the card shares the same flavour text from its Midnight Hunt version, which is different from the one with the werewolf flavour text, which is different again from its Shadows Over Innistrad printing. Fun! Pack 7. I really like Heron of Hope. There's no flavour text, but it resonates nicely with the story if you know the histories of the Griffs. Rotten Reunion is also fun because it mimics the farmer and his daughter from American Gothic. But our spotlight card is Dreamroot Cascade, mostly because it's a dual land and those are really, really useful in every kind of deck that can run them. Pack 8. And I've already spotted more corrupt behemoth. Just a big dumb boy. I'm a fan. And Gavany Silversmith, which feels like a reference to Gavany Ironwright, at least in terms of flavour. The Spotlight card is Fields of Ruin, however. Mostly because I'm a bit of a dick, and I really enjoy land destruction. And this one is a fair one though, as you also lose a land technically, and then both of you get to replace it, so, you know, could be more egregious. Pack 9. And we have another mythic in Hallowed Haunting. But, once again, I do love a big dumb boy, so our Spotlight card is Unhallowed Phalanx. Phalanx? Whatever. It's not a good card, it's expensive, and it enters tapped. But it joins the rank of other Innistrad cards like the Tree of Redemption and Triskaidekaphile, which make reference to the number 13. A lot of fun. Pack 10. Oh, and look, we got old stick fingers. He was the antagonist in a side story featuring Rem Carolus. Is that enough to make him our spotlight card? Yeah, go on. It's a good story. Rem is depicted as being a bit fresh-faced for me. I mean, previously he was like an old gruff near retirement type, but the Stickfinger story was still cool. A real actual horror story monster that could very easily be in a film about a haunted cabin in the forests or something. Pack 11. And we have some choices for Spotlight card here. Is it Tovalor, who I don't like as a character. I think introducing dire werewolves did nothing but make regular werewolves look less scary in comparison. But I do appreciate that he lets you play with all of the old werewolf cards, not just the dumb daybound nightbound ones that ugh. No, you know what, that's another video. Is our spotlight card Sundown Pass? As I said, dual lands are very, very good. Also no, because our spotlight card is actually Bride's Gown. Mostly so I can point out the colour of it. White. Also look at Wedding Ring, its thematic companion. White. And now let's look at the bride herself. Olivia Crimson Bride. Black Red. She cannot have her ring or gown in her own commander deck. What the actual fuck were they thinking? Oh, and now she gets white, but she's dressed as a cowboy. Fuck you, Watsy. Pack 12. And another mythic in Maniform Hellkite. But our spotlight card has to go to Pithing Needle. Because it's just an awesome card, and I love this Innistrad reskin. Very good. I remember being thrilled when they announced this. And that's it. 12 packs. Mr. Hands, if you could sort the cards into colours for me. Makes deck building a little bit easier, I find. Okay, and now if you could tidy it up a bit, thank you. We want to make two standard decks, so let's look at the lands first. A standard deck is 60 cards, and you usually want around about 24 of them to be lands. Now, obviously I'm not worrying about basics here, I'll get those from somewhere else. But if we use any of these three, they can go towards our total. Unless you're playing a mono deck, you normally want a lot more dual lands, like this Sundown Pass here, for standard. 
So again, these decks are not going to be competitive in a standard environment, but they will be standard legal and hopefully balanced so that if you and your friends did do what I'm doing now, you'd have a good time playing them against each other at the very least. This one lends itself very nice to a green-blue deck, the previous one a red-white deck, which may be a consideration for deck building. Field of Ruin is also good for two reasons in standard. One, people normally play a lot of non-basic lands in standard and they rely on them, so removal can hurt. And two, this can be used to fetch up basic lands of a colour that you're missing in an emergency. Let's look at the artefacts next. They're colourless, they can go in any deck. And I'll probably split those honoured heirlooms out to one per deck because they're also good for mana fixing, especially in a deck without any dual lands. But nothing else here really screams at me about a must include or any particular type of deck that we want to make, so let's look at the multicoloured cards. Okay, now this is a bit of a different story. This isn't commander, so we don't need to build around one legendary creature. Especially in a standard 60 card deck, there's a good chance we won't even draw that card in a game. But, looking at these cards can be a good way to figure out what archetypes are included in a set, or give us an idea of gameplay styles and guide our choices as to what cards to add to a deck. Okay, so, quick fire. Show me all of the green creatures. Now all of the green spells. Now the red creatures. Now the red spells. Black creatures. Black spells. Blue creatures? I mean, there are not many doubles here, are there? Blue spells. White creatures. And finally, white spells. Okay, Mr. Hands, let's go back to the multicolored cards. Thank you. When building a standard deck, we are allowed to include full playsets. That is, four copies of each card, if we like. Pulling multiple copies of a card when opening packs like this can influence me during deck building, because one of the things that we want is deck consistency. Knowing that we're likely to draw the same cards reliably helps us with our game plan and helps us win matches. But this is just two sets smashed together, and it's really showing here. I'd have been better off trying to build a commander deck, I think, because this is all just single copies of each card. So these standard decks are going to have very little consistency. So as I haven't had much guidance from the cards themselves, I think I'm just going to follow my heart and build a red-white deck. As you can see, we already have three cards. A dual land, which is nice. Rem, who's a cheap enough flying haste 2-3 that cares about spell damage. And a spell to actually do said damage. Not a bad start. Including basic lands, that's 26 cards down, 34 more to go. Let's just pull every red and white spell that also deals damage and, uh, oh, there's only three of them. Well, okay, I guess we're going to add those two. Uh, what's that you've got, Mr. Hans? Hallowed Haunting? Yeah, it's a mythic, but it needs seven or more enchantments, and look, we've only got nine in these colours. If I had to guess, I'd say that's going to be better for a white-blue deck. No, I think from the red creatures that you showed me, I'd pick these ten. Maniform Hellkite also cares about spells, which kind of works with our direct damage cards. And the rest are either like Pyre Spawn, which deals free damage when it dies, and Brimstone Vandal, which ugh, deals one damage because of that dumb day-night mechanic, which all follow a similar ping damage playstyle. Or they're cards like Lamhot Harrier, which stops a creature from blocking, and Voldar and Stinger, which has first strike and can pump its attacks, which lean more into Rem's flying and haste mechanics as creatures that are just an oppressive nuisance to deal with. From the white creatures, I'd pick these 10, with cards like Gavany Trapper, which can tap a creature, and Estward Shield Basher, which can become indestructible when it attacks, which are also creatures that are annoying to deal with, or cards like Angelic Quartermaster, which adds plus one plus one counters when it enters, and Travelling Minister, which adds plus one plus zero to a creature till end of turn, helping to make our annoying creatures a little bit more powerful. Oh, also we've included Brutal Cathar, because while he can go into any white deck, he flips into a red card, this is a red-white deck, and that kind of thing just sort of pleases me. Oh, and hey, actually, that reminds me. Mr. Hans, would you mind going and finding that Honored Heirloom? This deck is going to need mana fixing. Oh, and you know what? That Piffing Needle too, just because I think it's cool. So, overall, including basic lands, that's 51 cards. Almost a 50-50 split between red and white. Only 21 creatures, which is not many for a standard deck, but we do have a bit of a Spells Matter theme going on, so maybe it'll work out. I mean, that's half the fun of trying to build a full deck out of a small selection of packs. Speaking of spells, we need nine more. And here are my picks. A selection of cards like Sure Strike, which can give a creature plus three plus zero and first strike. Lunar Frenzy, that can give a creature plus X plus zero, first strike and trample, to make our creatures even more annoying. Curse of the Shaken Fae for the ping damage, and cards like Fierce Retribution, which destroys a creature, and Borrowed Time, which can exile a creature for removal because dealing with your opponent's threats is always a big part of any deck. And that's all of our cards. 
The mana curve is okay, a 50-50 split in colours has its ups and its downs in a deck without many dual lands. And we're not really sticking to a single theme or playstyle, but it's okay. Some real pre-release vibes from this deck I suspect. For our next deck, there were three colour combinations that caught my eye. Green-blue, we've got that dual land and a single creature, but it doesn't do much to inspire me. Runo Stromkirk on the other hand is another favourite character of mine, and should have had red in him for commander. Other Stromkirks have red in them. Stromkirk Captain is literally black-red. But ugh, alright. Here's their leader in just blue-black because, you know, fuck me I guess. But am I going to build around him here? His flip side plays best alongside Kraken, Leviathan, Octopus and Serpent cards, so okay. Mr. Hands, how many of those did we pull? Ah, oh, right, okay. Holebreaker Horror. I mean it's a good one, but probably not that then. Which just leaves Grizzly Ghoul in green-black, and excitingly, Old Stickfingers. So I guess we're sort of recreating the events of that side story where Stickfingers went up against Rem. But I guess this time with Zombie Bears. Yeah, okay, maybe not then. Now, for black creatures, I picked these ten, because both the bear and stick fingers care about our own creatures dying or going to the graveyard. So cards like Ecstatic Awakener, which gives us a sacrifice outlet, and Novice Occultist, which draw us a card and gain us life when it dies, feed into that playstyle. Slaughter Specialist creates tokens when it enters, as does Diagraph Horde, which give us more creatures to kill. But, if I'm being honest, cards like this and Dreadhound, Unhallow Phalanx, and Dreadfeast Demon are all a bit expensive for this deck. They're throwing the mana curve way off. I'm just including them because I think they're cool. I like them, so they're going in. For this deck we need a lot of creatures though, so I've picked these 12 green ones. Mostly because they either like Dawnheart Mentor, which creates a token when it enters, and Reclusive Taxidermist, which cares about cards in our graveyard, supporting our existing playstyles, or they're cheap and cheerful, like Toxic Scorpion, which has Death Touch and gives it to another creature, and Sporeback Wolf, which is a 2 mana 2-4 two on your turn, in hopes that they're decent enough includes on their own and the lower cost can help balance out the mana curve. So let's add those creatures, an Honored Heirloom, and I guess we don't have a Jewel Land, so that Field of Ruin? Altogether, given us 49 cards, only 11 more to go. For black spells, I picked cards like Undying Malice, which saves a creature from dying, and Crawl from the Cellar, which brings one back from the graveyard, because we're going to be killing a bunch of our own creatures as well as Ghoulish Procession, oh that was a mouthful, for token generation, and Foul Play for a bit of removal. And speaking of removal, for green I picked these cards which include Plummet, which destroys a creature with flying, and Return to Nature, to destroy an artifact or enchantment. We've also got Dryad's Removal, which also brings cards back from the graveyard, oh Dryad's Revival, sorry, and two copies of Path to the Festival, because we don't have any jewel lands, so we're really going to want to fetch up some basics. And that's our deck! A little heavy on the mana curve and not quite as aggressive as our last deck, but with a few big creatures which will hopefully lead to very dramatic swings during gameplay and the potential of heavy damage. So that's it, our two decks, Rem Carolus vs Old Stickfingers. I'll leave a link in the description below if you want to read the story featuring them. Spread them out Mr Hands, let's get a good look at them. Gorgeous. Let me know in the comments which of these two decks you'd rather pilot. So overall, I haven't played either of these decks, which is admittedly the important part but I had a lot of fun putting them together. I can see the issues though. Price aside, looking at them spread out like that, it's hard to tell which card is which because of the grayscale. Also, not a single playset of cards, and barely any doubles, which means the decks are gonna be jank. A bit pre-release, like I said earlier. However, it is doable. If you'd have bought this, you could have put several decks together, and I did have fun doing it. I think if it was reasonably priced, it would have only been a bit of a disappointment due to the lack of curation. I think it was the price point that really pushed the set over the edge. Let me know what you guys think in the comments below. Cynthia Williams has gone, and I wonder if that means that sets like these are gone with her. I guess we're going to see going forward. But you know what they say, sometimes better the brimstone vandal that you know. You know? Thank you very much for watching this video, and thank you to everyone that supports me, like James Diamond, and the rest of my patrons whose names are on screen now. I'd also like to thank the sponsor for this video, me and my Patreon page, where you can get your name credited on screen too. Check it out in the link in the description below. Hit the like button, leave a comment, install an ad block. Did you enjoy this sort of video, where I'm box opening? Let me know. Most importantly, subscribe and share this video with a friend. Hit the notification bell and do all those things the algorithm loves. If you agree or disagree with any of my points, or deck building techniques, or if you want to see me do a video on another subject, let me know and I will see you next time.